Yeah, so I'm giving a, an introduction to the discussion today. Um, cool. So yeah, um, kia ora everyone. To introduce myself, my name is Romani and I've been a member of the Whanganui Aotearoa branch of the International Socialists for quite a long time. Um, so I've been involved in a lot of different campaigns through the years. Um, I used to study here at Vic. Um, I've worked as a secondary school teacher. I'm currently back studying at Massey and I'm a student rep with the Student Association. So we'll see if we can get some more Massey students involved with those Palestine actions as well. It would be really um, awesome. So um, the name of this meeting in my introduction is How to Bring Down the Government. Um, and I'll just clarify um, that in this instance, we're not talking about revolution necessarily, you know, I mean, like, we'll see how we go. No. Um, but so last week, Brad talked about um, the struggle for socialism and the wider struggle for human liberation. Um, and that talk was recorded. So you'll be able to hear that if you missed out on it. This is more about the immediate struggle to resist this right wing government and the attacks that they are um, putting on us. And um, yeah, and I believe that, you know, through struggle, we can actually thwart this government and stop them from, from carrying out the attacks that they are planning. And this is connected to that wider project of building socialism because it's through these immediate struggles um, that, you know, the contradictions and the tensions in the system become clear. And that's how we gain the knowledge and the experience and how we build the alliances that can actually challenge the whole system. Um, so, you know, in this space, we are always talking about socialist politics and things like that and trying to kind of like talk and radicalize people. But a moment of like rising struggle, like the one that we are entering into now, can kind of reach and radicalize a much num larger number of people much quicker, you know, than, than we can do. And that's what we're trying to kind of connect to and draw on and, yeah, inject a consciously socialist element into. Um, so for the question of how to bring down the government, I really feel like, you know, it, it's actually like a group effort, you know, a group brainstorming session. Um, what I'm going to do is give some broader sort of principles for organising and try to give some context for the situation that we're in. Obviously, I won't cover everything. So all of the thoughts that you're having about the current government and how to fight them, please, you know, keep those and we'll, um, yeah, we'll definitely hash them out in the in the discussion. Okay, so I've, I've kind of um, arranged it into tips. Um, so tip number one <laughs> for how to bring down the government is to ground, ground ourselves in history. As in familiarizing ourselves with the events that led us here, um, but also understanding how history works. So the socialist understanding of history is that um, one way to sum it up is, is the old saying that we have agency, you know, we have free will, but not in circumstances of our own choosing. Um, so we're shaped by what has happened before and we can shape what happens in the future. And that that shaping is not just done by powerful individuals, but by collectives. You know, it's done by the mass of people. Um, and we also understand that economics and politics are not separate and they're not neutral. So this cost of living crisis um, is really a cost of living contest to see who is going to shoulder the burden of the cost of living. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some historical facts about how we got here? Um, so first, obviously, you have to grapple with capitalism and colonialism. So we ground ourselves in the fact that we live in a society where the vast majority of people have been alienated from the land, from our labor, um, from the products of our labor and from each other. Um, that this is a system where wealth flows upwards. Um, the majority of people are being exploited and there's a large section of that majority that is kept deliberately poor and marginalized within that system. Um, the reserve army of labor, you know, that sort of drags down the conditions for everyone. It's a deliberate 
um, built into the system. Uh, and we need to understand that this is a system that is forced on Māori through the process of colonisation, which also saw Māori marginalised within this system and turned into that reserve army of labour. So the wealth of the country, all of the wealth that the government controls, all of the wealth um, of the rich within this country comes from the earth, from Papa Tuanuku in the first instance, um, from Māori, who were the kaitiaki of that wealth until colonisation in the second instance, and in the third instance, from all of our labour. So understanding this really shows up the lies that the government is spinning about how the poor, about the poor and how they are a drain on society. Um, and it shows as well that we have potential power as well. Another historical truth to contend with, Māori never ceded sovereignty. The authority that the Crown has taken, or any authority that the Crown has, was taken by force. And indeed, that the, pow the power that the state has over all of us comes, you know, in the final instance, from force, not from our consent. This government, in trying to deny this, seems to have only exposed it further, um, and in doing so has unleashed forces that it may not be able to contend with. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so speaking of history, let's have a brief look at the last time National was in power. So they oversaw an increase in inequality um, as more of the tax burden was shifted um, off the rich and onto the poor, um, as policies were pursued that were friendly to business and unfriendly to workers. So rights and protections for workers, such as the right to strike, were significantly curtailed under national. And these cutbacks were only partially um, restored under the last Labour government. Uh, this national government ruled in coalition with ACT and the Māori Party, as it was then called. So that government's approach to Māori Crown relations was very different. Um, so the John Key government ruled under an official policy of biculturalism. So clearly the approach of both the National Party and Te Pāti Māori um, have changed a lot um, since then, and it's worth thinking about why, I think. Um, but we can see continuities as well. Uh, so while the key government operated under an official policy of biculturalism and negotiated, you know, many of the landmark sort of treaty settlements, they still oversaw the oppression of the vast majority of the Māori population. Um, like the current government, the last national government ramped up racist law and order policing, um, took part in <clears throat> shameless beneficiary bashing, um, and if we go further back as well, even the specific kind of anti-Māori racism um, that is cropping up isn't new either. So before the key government, back in 2007, then leader of the National Party, Don Brash, made his famous four-hour speech um, where he rallied against special privileges for Māori um, and called for one rule for all. Um, so we're not asking, you know, like where have these ideas come from, but why are they resurfacing again now? Um, that's something we can kind of tackle in the discussion. I think part of the answer is in, you know, global trends of the rise of these sort of far-right currents. Um, and part is the fact that scapegoating and division are very sort of durable tools for the right wing in, in times of crisis. Um, so back to the key years, the last national government, um, those who grew up during that period, um, remember this is a period of political demoralization. So historically, industrial action reached all time lows, so strikes, stop works. Um, and that's to say that, it's not to say that there was no fight back or no protest, but it was very possible to grow up during this time and to not see very much, much at all. Um, so it was possible for me, for someone my age, um, to grow up and never see a strike or even really know anyone who's gone on strike. The situation is very different for people who've grown up in more recent years, um, many of whom have been striking for climate since they were in high school or even in primary school. Um, an uptick in struggle 
in more recent years um, coincided with global trends mm. um, like the school strike for climate um, and with the election of a Labour government under Ardern in 2017 who were talking a much bigger game um, than Labour governments have been talking for a while. Um, of course, Labour squandered the opportunity um, that they were given, failing to deliver the transformation that they were promising, um, even, you know, uh, when they achieved an overwhelming majority in the 2020 election. Um, so Labour's failures and how they, you know, have been part of what's delivered us, you know, into this current situation is you know, a talk for another day, something we can touch on more in discussion. Um, but I want to focus on something a bit more positive. Um, so while the election of right-wing governments has historically kind of diffused industrial struggle and protest, um, it's not inevitable. So the last right-wing government ruled over, you know, a demobilised um, population. Over de decades, traditions of collective organising have been sort of slowly eroding, but we have seen a revival um, in recent years. So this new right-wing government is contending with the school strike generation, the kohanga reo generation, uh, the ihumato generation. So I personally went from never having witnessed a strike in my life to taking part in my late 20s in a joint secondary primary teacher strike that was actually the largest strike in New Zealand history at the time. Mm -hmm. All right, so that brings us to uh, tip number two. That was all ground ourselves in history. Oh. You know, it's, it's easy to get kind of lost in that process but sometimes. But step number two, um, know your enemy. So the National Party uh, was formed as an alliance between um, rural farming and urban bourgeois interests, and they ruled for the rich since their inception, um, often by scapegoating and demonizing the poor. Luxon, their current leader, um, is a businessman. He has been the CEO on Unilever Canada um, of Air New Zealand as well. His net worth is estimated to be in the region of 30 million. He has a property portfolio worth about um, 21 million. And this business background uh, is also um, a potential weakness. So while Luxon doesn't get grilled about his inexperience in the way that Ardern did because of sexism, um, he actually isn't very experienced. So he's, you know, a businessman, not a politician. And he may find that in the present juncture, those skills are not as transferable as he might have hoped that they would be. Um, ACT stands for the Association of Consumers and Taxpayers. Um, they, which tells you a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. um, they've historically acted as a lackey for national, um, supporting national, uh, and representing a sort of smaller group of uh, affluent urbanites um, whose wealth relied on residential property values propped up by minimal taxation uh, and cuts to social services. David Seymour may be a clown, um, mm -hmm. but he has managed to convert the party um, from a fringe group into something resembling an actual political force at the present moment, um, in large part by courting the alt-right and the far-right. Um, culminating, of course, in his ambitions to rewrite the principles of the Tiriti o Waitangi um, as a defense of private property rights with no mention of Māori at all. Um, and Winston Peters uh, is an old guy. Um, like, yeah, uh, so New Zealand first. You know, it's 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 a party of sort of fretful middle class get off my lawn um, types, and they have also managed to scrape together some form of relevance by engaging in culture war politics. Um, and they have been singling out um, trans people in particular. So they were the ones pushing um, for scrapping gender and sexuality education in schools. That was one of their platforms. Um, so this coalition got into power by appealing to the fears and resentments of their sort of middle class base. And they got there because the rich put them there, um, raking in record campaign donations from the wealthiest individuals and businesses in New Zealand. 
Um, and they are now proceeding to rule in those interests, um, shifting the tax burden off the rich back onto the poor, loosening environmental protections and workers' rights um, to make it easier for businesses to make money, um, and following through on their cultural war rhetoric by attacking Māori and minority groups um, like trans people. And I think it's significant that they are attacking the bottom of society. So they're really singling out beneficiaries, gangs, you know, delinquent youth, um, groups that it's easy to scapegoat. Um, so alongside these kind of explicit attacks on Māori, there's also like more of a key era style of racism, you know, where they can say things like suspected gang members and know that police and other racists will hear Māori. Um, and what they're doing is they're trying to humiliate those who are lower in society into accepting worse conditions, um, sort of dragging down conditions for everyone and making sure that those who are struggling are blaming those beneath them rather than those above them for their problems. Um, and of course, sowing division between Māori and Tangata Tiriti is part of that project as well. So this is the project that we're up against. Um, and the only way to counter this project of division is with unwavering solidarity, um, which we I think we've already seen some examples of today. Thank you for those who shared earlier. Um, I want to conclude this section with some cause for hope as well. Um, so this coalition is a bit of an unstable force. Luxon himself called it a coalition of chaos um, back before he realised that it was the coalition he was going to be having to work with. Um, and there may be opportunities for us to exploit this instability. Um, and we're also seeing signs that they are feeling um, this instability and the, the turning of public opinion potentially against them. So national prior to the election, had to equivocate on the controversial treaty principles bill, um, sort of keeping their degree of support quite ambiguous. Mm. Um, after they, the embarrassing leak and a grueling Waipangi day, um, Luxon confirmed that National definitely would be supporting the bill only to the select committee stage um, and no further than that. Um, and Seymour has called him out on this in the media, you know, um, prompting these sort of embarrassing exchanges where Luxon sort of ooh, just stammers in response. And, yeah, there's been a, a lot of interesting news recently. So, of course, we have Luxon being rightly shamed into giving up the accommodation supplement he was taking to live in one of the many properties that he owns, mortgage-free in Wellington, um, so he was taking an accommodation supplement of 52K to live in his own house. And I've like, I'm not very good at maths, but I tried to figure out what it is for students and, and beneficiaries. And I think the maximum students and beneficiaries can get is 15K as accommodation supplement. Yeah, so uh, rightly shamed for that. And he has now uh, backed down on that. I should say that he's back down because it's bad PR, because, of course, you know, he doesn't actually feel shame um, because the next week he was in the media talking about maybe taking away lunches from school children. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm trying to encourage hope here rather than complacency. Um, another piece of recent news, the government is pushing through the disestablishment of Te Aka Whai Ora, um, the Māori Health Authority, without even waiting for any results of the Waitangi Tribunal um, hearing. So what I'm kind of taking from this is that, you know, disapproval is not always going to be enough. You know, they need to feel consequences. Um, step three, know your allies. Um, so speaking of consequences, in the latest polls, I think, the last I checked, the only party that had increased in popularity was Te Pāti Māori. Um, and I think that that party is um, quite illustrative of this point. So Te Pāti Māori came out of Flax Roots protests um, against the confiscation of the foreshore and seabed in 2004, and their base was with um, the Māori working class. But in 2008, they changed course. Um, so they entered into a deal with National, uh, and many of the more radical elements split off to form the short-lived Mana Party. Um, after the party took this course of um, going in with National, uh, their 
um, support fell year on year. Their votes sort of um, declined at that point, um, unsurprisingly, because they'd effectively abandoned their working class Māori base. And now a dramatic shift in approach. So Te Pāti Māori has tacked left again, um, reuniting with many of the elements that left during the key years. Uh, and they're putting forward a more radical, unapologetic version of Tina Ranga Tiratanga, um, along with policies that will actually help their working class base. And they're seeing a huge electoral revival um, because of this. And they're also showing that they have a focus outside of parliament too. So they're mobilizing their supporters as well um, to get involved with um, protests and organizing. So what I'm saying is um, Te Pāti Māori and their supporters are, can be allies in this period, but I'm also saying that they're showing um, the value of flax roots organising and of seeing that as being the place to seek um, alliances. So as socialists, obviously, we believe that workers have the power and the motivation to change the society for the better, um, you know, because, you know, collectively we're dispossessed and because collectively we have our hands on the machinery that sort of uh, keeps society going. So we look for alliances and collective organising among the space for, you know, that project of transforming society and for, you know, um, immediate tasks like fighting back against this government. Um, so, yeah, and I think when we're talking about, you know, knowing your allies, building alliances, um, the important thing to remember is that the fight back is already happening, you know, so we in the room don't need to sort of conjure or invent a struggle against the government out of nowhere. Um, it's already happening. So Māori are rising up um, and are uniting in a way that hasn't been seen for a long time. So I think it was 10,000 answering the call from the Kingitanga to assemble at Tūranga Waiwai Marae. Um, from all across the Motu, um, Luxon is being hailed as the man who united the iwi. Mm -hmm. um, and Māori are also calling for and receiving solidarity from Tangata Tiriti as well. Um, speaking of solidarity, at any Tuitu to Tiriti rally, you'll hear speeches made in solidarity with Palestine mm -hmm. and vice versa as well. So the people who are most active in, these, in the struggle at the moment understand that concept of solidarity. Um, and it's worth notice, noting that the protests against the genocide in Gaza, Gaza are the largest anti-war movement that we've seen in decades. And we know that Indigenous struggles and anti-war movements have the potential to seriously hurt the legitimacy um, of a government in power. And it's also true that a rising tide uh, lifts all ships. So the pride hikoi um, last week was bigger and more political than I've seen it for a long time. And once again, showing the value of solidarity. Um, as people, again, were marching with Free Palestine and Toitu Tititi banners. So the fact that people are already mobilizing for these struggles makes them more likely to mobilize for others, you know, and it encourages people to see that struggle is possible and it's necessary um, and demonstrate, demonstrates how it's to be done, you know. Um, and it raises the possibility of struggle um, emerging in other areas as well. All right, so step three was know your allies. Uh, step four is know yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to know yourself in order to make connections with others. So that might be whakapapa connections, connections in terms um, of ideas or values or politics, and connections in terms of shared interests and goals. Um, so in socialist politics, we talk about class consciousness. So seeing where your long-term interests lie and not falling prey to scapegoating or petty divisions. And you also know, you need to know yourself to know where your power lies. So for workers, this means understanding that you have the power to organize collectively with your fellow workers and to the power to bring society to a standstill by withdrawing that labor. That massive teacher strike, um, you know, like the hassle that we were given for that disruption um, of all of the schools um, being out of function and then all of the, you know, um, the impact of that then on the families not knowing what to do with, you know, um, with childcare. 
Um, and that's the point, you know, it's making, it's highlighting the contribution that is actually being made. Um, so of all of the tools in Akite, um, industrial action is one that could really land a blow against this government um, and lend material weight to the struggles that are happening. Um, but mass mobilization is also powerful in itself. Um, so students can also bring a city to a standstill um, by filling the streets as they have done for courses in recent years, um, such as the school strike or Palestine or Ihumata. Uh, and the importance of knowing yourself is true for collectives as well as individuals. So as an organization, you know, we need to have an understanding of what our principles and politics are so that then we can form alliances with other people for shared goals while still, you know, standing strong in your own principles. And as individuals and organisations, we also um, need to understand what we can contribute to the struggle and what roles we can take on. So as the ISO, one of the key roles that we play um, is doing what we're doing here today. So sort of talking about politics, talking about socialism, um, making sure that the insights of history are not being lost and providing a forum where we can bring all of our experiences and ideas from the struggle um, and share them and reflect on them. Because just action without reflection sort of goes, goes nowhere. So rather than trying to, you know, just recruit people to one struggle or another, we're trying to recruit them to the wider socialist, uh, socialist project. Excuse me. Just have to... <clears throat> So that, um, yeah, so we can keep connecting these struggles and can continue that political fight from year to year as struggles sort of come and go and different political um, fights emerge in the future. And that's why we kind of put equal weight on organising, as we've seen, um, and on education as well. And then within this, of course, you know, everyone brings something different to the struggle. You know, people write, people talk, people march. Um, we all have different strengths. And so this is um, something we should all be nurturing as well. And I think the, <coughs> the note that I'll end on um, is for us as individuals and in our collectives uh, is to, to just start where you are. So start on your campus, in your workplace, uh, in your union, in your student association, in local campaigns that you're connected with in your area and help make the connections between these issues that people care about um, and are affected by and encourage people to take that uh, and to get out into the streets with it. And that is how we'll bring down the government.